So, yeah. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased uh, to uh, open. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm very pleased to open um, the discussion today on the short term energy uh, crisis uh, management. In the, uh, in the European Union. Uh, yesterday, Simona, in his panel, uh, discussed with us the, the long-term implications of the, uh, of the current energy crisis and including opportunities of that in terms of uh, international collaboration, technology, and yeah, essentially highlighting that there are choices between good options. Now, today, the, uh, the task that I have is a, is a bit more challenging. I would think, uh, because we are going to have the more mundane challenge of discussing how we essentially prevent systemic, yeah, a systemic crisis or systemic risk to uh, to materialize. Um, you all are aware that uh, that Europe is ahead of a very very tough winter. Um, we already now see prices in gas and electricity on the wholesale markets uh, increased tenfold. Uh, the implications of that for companies, for consumers, also for energy companies, uh, are, uh, are very disturbing. And uh, it's an unprecedented situation that uh, is quite clear, cannot kind of stay like that for, uh, for another year or two, uh, because the political implications of this will also be, not only internally, but also for Europe's uh, foreign policy, will be drastic. So, this crisis needs to be managed, and it needs to be managed in a, uh, in a sensible way. And the problem is, in, in contrast to, uh, to, to the good options that, uh, that Simona had to compare yesterday, we are today have to compare essentially a lot of relatively bad options and, and choose the, the least bad of them. Now, the, uh, the great thing is that I have an excellent panel today to, uh, to discuss that with. Um, four panelists that are essentially sitting in the middle of the, of the storm, uh, all extremely busy at the moment because the, the crisis is taking a, a very strong toll on them. And um, they are not only dealing with uh, kind of addressing the symptoms of the crisis, but also trying to address the, the root causes. Now, without further ado, I think uh, it would be best to ask each of the panelists to come up with two or three uh, kind of main ideas of what they think needs to be done or what they are already doing in order to make sure that we get over the winter in a way that kind of does not crash our, uh, our energy system. So, I would like to, to start by, by giving the floor to, uh, to Ditte Jul Jorgensen. Um, she is the Director General at, uh, at DG Enner and kind of the person at which a lot of the, uh, the crisis management at the European level currently converges. So Ditte, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for this timely uh, discussion. Uh, we are focusing uh, in today's discussion, as you said, on the short term, but maybe just one comment here, which is it is critical that what we do short term, what we do in terms of emergency intervention, uh, aligns with our longer term strategic objectives. And so one has to be careful not to uh, not to look at those two in, in isolation. So just as a follow up to that. Um, and the other point you were making is about symptoms and, and root causes. Again, even when we act swiftly, when we act in a crisis, as much as possible, the, we should get close to the root causes so that we're not just treating symptoms, but really making the changes that are necessary in the European energy market, in the European energy union. You've asked for me to say two or three things. I cannot limit myself to two, to two or three things because what we're looking at is a crisis uh, that comes at us from many different sides at the same time and that impacts all of our energy system and all of our economy. So just to take a step back, where are we? Um, the, the crisis is global. You see uh, at the global level uh, very tight markets and an imbalance between demand essentially coming online faster than supply. We could see that already as a result of the COVID lockdown in the sense that demand spiked when we opened again, while the investments into additional supply, additional LNG capacity, for example, coming online was delayed. So you had that problem uh, already at, uh, at that stage. This was then combined with what we uh, saw already last spring, decrease in supply from Russia that made it difficult for Europe to fill its gas storage. Clearly, this was planned 
this, uh, this was a, a measure, a weaponization of gas that started before the war. And obviously, the war, the Russian uh, invasion into Ukraine uh, has, ha has had a significant further impact in terms of insecurity and in terms of the continued lowering of, uh, of supplies. So we are working, as you've also said, with some very significant geopolitical challenges as well as global imbalances in the energy markets. And I think that's an important perspective to have when we look at what do we do within Europe, what can we do? There is a lot we can do. Some of these aspects we are the masters of, our demand, for example, but other aspects are outside our control, global markets, those global imbalances. Uh, and so uh, it, that context, that uh, perspective on what can we do and how do we best act and how do we best align it with our longer term targets, I think is a critical one uh, to have. So just to briefly recall, what have we, what have we done uh, since the war? We have uh, launched the Repower EU strategy and action plan essentially to allow us to move away from uh, our dependence on Russian fossil fuels. Three simple components. If really to, to simplify, we need to reduce our consumption, we need renewables, and we need to replace Russian sources with other sources. So the, those are the three key uh, components. And whatever we do, we need to start with the lowering of consumption. Reducing our demand is where we are in control, uh, and it is a necessary element of any, of any action uh, that we take. We have reviewed, all member states have reviewed their national preparedness plans. As we could see, we were getting into a, a difficult filling season, a difficult end of the winter last year. Um, we have adopted a storage uh, regulation, first time ever, that we have a European uh, a common rule set around gas storage. Uh, you may have seen that the target was 80% this year by 1st of November. We are currently at 82, so we're ahead of schedule. That hasn't been cheap, it hasn't been easy. Uh, but it was necessary to do that to make sure we go into the winter as prepared uh, as possible. And then, of course, this summer we uh, uh, intervened decisively on our demand, on the demand side, by the uh, agreement to reduce overall demand of natural gas across the European Union to 15%, and by giving ourselves a new tool, an EU alert mechanism, that can be triggered when that is necessary in gas. And now that we have done that, we are more ready for further action. We are less vulnerable, we are better prepared. And so the reason I set this out in the framing is, I think the sequencing of what we can do in terms of intervening, intervening into energy markets is absolutely critical. You cannot start intervening on gas prices before you know that you have what you need for the winter and before you have reduced your demand because an intervention into gas prices could have an impact on the supplies. So again, sequencing really matters in what we're doing. What we're seeing now in the markets is um, very, very high electricity prices. They have been high since the beginning of the crisis uh, because uh, it, the electricity market is exactly that. It's a market. And so the highest marginal cost, the highest marginal price sets the overall prices, not by design, but by how markets function. Um, that uh, has a very significant impact on our households, it has a significant impact on our, uh, on our competitiveness, on our industry, uh, and we do see increasingly serious liquidity concerns out there and financial market uh, uh, challenges uh, as well. So here and now our focus is on uh, what do we do to, uh, to alleviate that, uh, that challenge. You will have seen President von der Leyen announce what we're working on, we're working on demand reduction, shaving off the peaks in terms of electricity demand. We are working on uh, a measure to, uh, get, uh, to, to, uh, to make sure that we can uh, help vulnerable households, that we can create revenues that can go back to consumers so that they can be compensated by, uh, by a proposal um, in, uh, in, in that regard. And we're working on other aspects of a possible package of possible proposals. They will be discussed among ministers on Friday, so I cannot today go into to details of that, but you will have, have seen the announcements of, uh, of the president. So rather than give you, this is the package, let me give you the basic principles that are guiding us uh, in, what, in what we do. First of all, we're in an emergency, so whatever we do, it has to be simple and it has to be implementable across Europe. Secondly, we obviously want to make sure that we protect our internal market. Our internal market and our internal energy market gives us security of supply, it helps on the price setting, it helps making sure that the energy goes where it is needed. We obviously want to make sure that whatever we do on electricity or other energy sources or other energy carriers, uh, that we do not increase the gas demand, because there is not going to be more gas out there. We need to continue to lower our gas, our gas demand. 
Obviously, we also want to make sure that whatever we do, we don't put at risk our security of supply. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we help consumers, we help, and here I'm talking households, but of course also the business side of, of things, the industry side of things. And then, as I said at the beginning, we have to make sure that whatever we do, we align with our long-term strategic objectives. And here I'm think, talking about, obviously, the Green Deal, the, uh, the transition towards more renewables, more energy efficient energy systems, more electrification uh, and the use of, uh, of green hydrogen in particular as one of the energy carriers. So whatever you will see coming from us uh, in, in the coming week and beyond will be built on, uh, on these key principles and always starting with we need to reduce uh, demand, otherwise the other measures we need to take will either not be effective or will have uh, negative uh, negative effects and so uh, an important way to uh, to uh, uh, approach that and uh, I think I'll stop there I could speak for hours about this because there really is a lot going on but I think uh, I should leave the floor to others as well thank you yeah, thanks a lot uh, I mean it's fascinating the uh, kind of the, the compre uh, comprehensive principles you set out and uh, kind of, uh, when starting to think about how to square this circle uh, it's uh, probably getting interesting so uh, I hope we can come back to that in the uh, in the panel discussion and now let me give the the floor to Carlos Staracha, uh, Francesco Staracha, the uh, CEO of um, NL sorry I'm just having to uh, to look back and um, he is yeah, uh, leading one of the uh, largest European energy companies active in, uh, in essentially uh, all major uh, energy sources and in many European countries. So he has a very broad view and, and, a, and a very clear view on the, uh, on the challenges ahead. And um, I would also like to ask you what are kind of essentially your two or three things that, uh, that you would hope the, uh, the Commission this Friday or in the, in the coming weeks and months or national governments come up with in order to protect European citizens and, uh, and companies against this energy crisis? Uh, thank you, Georg, and, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, I want to uh, start from where uh, the Director General uh, uh, has just uh, ended. I think that it is important that we preserve certain key principles, whatever we do, that they are clearly uh, the direction in which we were heading, which is the transformation of the energy sector in Europe towards a decarbonized uh, um, end. And I think that is today something that the present crisis reinforces in, if you want, in a spectacular manner. And that must be preserved by all means. Uh, whatever measures we implement in the short term should not go in the direction of increasing, but rather decreasing the demand of gas and should not impair our ability to source gas uh, wherever possible on the very short term in order to survive not only the, the, the next winter, but also the spring and summer that follow, because let's not forget, if we get through the winter, we will get through the winter with a depleted storage that needs to be replaced immediately in the field. So what are the things we think are necessary? And before we say that, let me just point out one little, but not so little, I mean, corollary that um, results from the extremely high and totally unwarranted uh, prices of gas that we have in Europe today, not only this is creating havoc on the energy cost standpoint. So it's placing a burden on the industry and, and households in terms of energy costs going forward. But um, more sadly, but much more, more impactful is the fact that most players are exposed to margin um, deposits. So the money that players have to set aside when they operate on the stock exchange on the exchange on the gas exchange uh, as a function of the variation and the volatility of the TTF index. Today the global exposure of all the players in Europe exceeds by far 200 billion euros which means that most companies and that includes us but um, I would say most companies all the companies that work on the gas market have to set aside cash in order to uh, manage the volatility of, uh, of the margins, uh, the evolution of the margins that are uh, as a function of the TTF index. This means that you have 100 billions of euros that cannot be used. 
they cannot be used for investments and they cannot be used for any other sort of um, employment if not just to to cover the commitments that each company has made on this on this platform and this number varies it goes up or down as a function of the ttf index this is about tenfold what normally has been in the last years so it is very important to notice that some countries have started the government of some countries have started helping companies to put money aside because the companies don't have any more we saw switzerland doing that yesterday we saw sweden starting to do that the day before we saw germany doing it a little bit in the past so this is something that is creating a problem for the 23 24 investment cycle i mean most companies will not be able to invest enough because of the money paralyzed in this strange and completely artificial uh, situation. So this second consideration coupled with the first one, the incredible variation of the prices of the TTF index, puts us in the, in the, in the, in the mindset to say that we should take a break sanction a timeout and a reset to the TTF index volatility. If you want something that has already happened in another exchange, the LME on, on nickel just a couple of months ago, so this volatility is today out of control. It does not reflect, it does not, I repeat, reflect the actual price of gas that is imported into Europe, but it rather reflects a preoccupation and some kind of let's say speculative approach to this uh, pricing that is creating itself, enhancing itself the problem. So I think it is important for decisions to be taken with the right uh, time and with the right access that this is a little bit stopped. We, we advocate for a cap to the index volatility, not to the price of gas. The, the two things are not the same thing. And, and this index should be capped for, I would say, a period of six to 12 months in order for this, uh, this um, frenzy of speculation to come down and let decision makers uh, and the industry survive this period. I think uh, the director general is right that this decision could not have been made before the storage was full and before we had some kind of visibility of how much gas we have for the winter. Now we have that. So I think it's the right time to do this. Uh, I, we are convinced that this measure will be taken no matter what people think. It will have to be taken sooner or later. And the later it, we take it, the more expensive uh, this decision will result to be. I think we have, as a second measure, to accelerate the reform of the electricity markets. Um, the separation between the marginal cost of generating electricity with combined cycle burning gas and nuclear or renewable energy that have not to depend on this commodity price is important. If you want, most integrated utilities already apply this. So it's not such a traumatic measure if, that people think. We, we, we do that all the time. When, when we sell power to our customers, we don't sell it based on marginal system pricing cost considerations. It would be crazy. But uh, I think it's important that we implement this market design. And more importantly, probably, is that we finally insert into the market design um, tools that uh, the European Union wants to have a long-term electricity market uh, tool. If you want to buy electricity 10 years or 15 years or 20 years in Europe, this is not there. This market doesn't exist but it does exist elsewhere in the world. And, and the fact that we had, if we did have such a market, this would be the natural place for renewable energy to show in a very transparent and clear manner, its convenience, the stability of the prices it can project and the interest that um, our um, industry would have in this tool. So we think it's important that this longer term market design phase is completed and this market is launched into Europe because that would 
indeed be the separation between the actual separation between gas priced electricity and non gas priced electricity. This is not a 10 years gas price market. So there would not be a 10 years gas price electricity market. And that would be the physical the differentiation that everybody will be able to see. The third thing I would like to, um, to emphasize, I think um, and the Director General has already done that, is that we need to accelerate the decarbonization of Europe. By doing this, we need to, in order to do this, we need to basically stop burning gas to, electricity, to produce electricity the fastest way possible. And that means accelerate the implementation of renewables. And to do that, we need faster permitting times and we need to free cash. So we need to stop this TTF because that is going to be preventing further investments from most companies. And second, we need to stop using gas to heat our homes. And that means a drastic implementation of heat pumps across the Eurozone by ways of good policies that most member states have been thinking about, but have not yet implemented in a concerted manner. And I think that is going to be a very important step to free ourselves from uh, the less intelligent use of gas that we have today, which is basically burning it to heat our homes and burning it to generate electricity. If we succeed to do that, Europe is likely to almost half its gas demand in the next five to 10 years, which is a big step if you want to look at a little bit longer, uh, longer term. I pause here because I think there will be time for uh, additional considerations later on. Thanks. Many thanks, Francesco. Uh, that was super interesting also how you kind of framed your um, kind of the reasoning for the interventions in the market. And uh, I hope we, uh, we find, uh, find time in the panel also to look a bit deeper into the question on how you think about uh, capping the volatility in the, uh, in the TTF. But uh, now, please allow me to uh, give the floor to, uh, to Claire Vesson. Uh, she has been in the, in the French government before, but now she is uh, Executive Vice President General Secretary at Engie. So also one of the, uh, one of the biggest European uh, utilities uh, with a bit uh, of a focus of, uh, in, in gas, but also uh, working a lot on electricity, for example, here in, in Belgium. Uh, so Claire, um, the same question as to... Yes, he hello everybody and uh, thanks a lot. I think this is a fascinating time to be addressing this question and uh, a really great panel. Uh, so let me, let me start by uh, rebounding on what uh, Dieter said. We, we are talking here about the energy system. We, we must not forget that, uh, I mean, we, we somehow sometimes have more of focus on gas because of a Russian crisis, but the reality is that gas and electricity are totally intertwined. Uh, today, when we are producing electricity, and that was just mentioned by Francisco, uh, we are using a lot of gas. Not only we are using a lot of gas, but a number of member states are putting back coal units online or extending the lifetime of coal units. So uh, if, we want, uh, if we want to have a proper picture, first thing not to forget is that, yes, we do need, and I'll come back to this, we do need energy savings. We do need them both on electricity and on gas because they are totally intertwined. That's the first thing. And second thing, uh, indeed, we must ensure that whatever we do is compatible with our carbon neutrality path. And in this respect, it's of course no fully bad news that coal is being put back online. As you know, uh, produ producing electricity out of coal produces twice as much as producing electricity out of gas. So really bad news, and we need to make sure as soon as possible that we are able to balance supply and demand in another way. So let, let me turn, to, turn then to two, uh, I would say two buckets, uh, a bit like uh, Dieter did. I think one is the physical balance and the other one is the, the issue of prices. Uh, of course, both are absolutely key. Physical balance, we know, do need to ensure the security of supply in the European Union. Uh, it, it's not a given, and the European Commission took a number of steps. When we look at demand, uh, I think one, one, uh, one thing to, uh, that's clearly a no-regret no move is more soberness, sobriété in French, uh, more, more energy efficiency. I mean, that's clearly a, a no-regret move. Why? Because we all know that to ensure carbon neutrality, we will need to decrease our energy consumption by 
30 to 40 percent. So whatever we do in this respect, that structural, is a step in the right direction. Second, uh, we do see some demand destruction in the short run, and I want to, to mention this because I think it's vastly underestimated. When we look at EU-wide industrial, well, uh, industrial uses, we already see quite a significant drop. Uh, when we look at German figures in particular, year on year, August, and uh, I know I'm talking in front of uh, many economists, uh, so like me, you look at those kind of figures, it's minus 30% year on year, the uh, German industrial demand of gas. Okay? So we do see some demand destruction, which to some extent is of course something that will be helpful from a security of, su uh, of supply perspective. At the same time, we need to be mindful of the fact that this probably indicates that there is a big macro shock underway. Uh, stepping a bit uh, aside from, uh, from the, the issue of energy. Uh, so that's the demand, demand side. On the supply side, uh, short run, like others have said, we, we do need to diversify, of course, and that's what we did as a, as a company at NG. We, we did diversify our sources of supply, of gas in particular. Uh, I mean, the, the, well, we, we are now at a point where, as you know, Gazprom has uh, cut its deliveries through Nord Stream 1. Uh, we, we have been in a situation where we thought this was a possible option. So during the last few months and since February, we made sure that we were diversifying to be able to supply our, our customers. And today we, we are in a, in a situation which uh, makes, makes us feel confident. But that's the short run. And there is this winter and then the next winter. And, uh, and we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, it's, uh, the level of storage today is indeed very encouraging. And, uh, and by the way, it's even uh, higher, for, inst for instance, in France, we're, uh, we're well above 90%. But we will need the storage, we will need the flows of, GNL, of LNG co continuing to come into Europe, which for now, for now we, we see. Uh, and we will need to make sure that we are able to face next winter again. So, so short term, this issue of diversity of supply, medium run, full agreement with what was said on we need to accelerate, we need to accelerate renewables, both electricity and gas. Biomethane has a strong potential. Uh, in a country like France, biomethane by 2030 can replace in volume Russian gas. So we, we need to push on uh, different, uh, different renewables. What, one small thing a small, a small thing, not so small, that we need to keep in mind when we think of the physical balance is what, you shouldn't only look at the volumes for the entire year. There is also the issue of peak demand. And Dieter mentioned peak demand. And here I would caution uh, a bit uh, and nuance a bit what Francesco said. We are in a, in a situation where the electricity system is already under big tension. Uh, for a number of reasons this year. Now, uh, there is, I mean, clearly less water, not much wind during the summer, uh, some issues of uh, capacity of, uh, uh, of nuclear plants that are online in France. So a number of factors which we hope some of them will, will disappear. Uh, hydro, frankly, we don't know. I mean, there is the issue of climate change. Uh, we need to be super careful not to overburden, in a way, the electricity system, in, in particular for peaks. And when we think about heating uh, in, uh, in residential housing, in France, we are already the country where there is the most, uh, uh, well, heating is mostly reliant on electricity, which means that our peak demand in winter is bigger. I mean, our elasticity to temperature is bigger than other EU countries. Uh, that makes a lot of, that produces a lot of tension on the system. So let's be mindful. Electricity everywhere very quickly may not, be the may not be the solution and some solutions such as hybrid heat pump may be a good way to combine electricity most of the time but some gas in, in peak. Let me just finish on uh, two, uh, well, on, on the issue of, uh, of prices because I think it's, uh, it, it, volume are key, prices are key. I think here uh, we need to realize that the market is clearly dysfunctional. That was said by, by the others. So yes, we do need some market intervention. Uh, we, we have been advocating for months for a price cap on the wholesale price of gas, not, which I mean requires of course a bit more elaboration, but that's the only way to decrease the macro shock on Europe 
make sure that the producers pay some of it. That's one. Second, on electricity, I was very encouraged to see what Kadri Simpson was saying on dismantling the automaticity of the increase in, in, the, in the price cap on electricity markets and even lowering the, the price. I think that goes in the very good direction. Last point, uh, when we look at prices, there are long-term arrangements between producers and, uh, and consumers, companies, PPAs. We should be able to develop, including trans-border PPAs, more easily in Europe. They are a good way to ensure prices that are OK for the producer, OK for the corporate. We do have a lot of PPAs, NG, elsewhere in the world. I think it's, I mean, there is a lot of potential there. And, and last, last point, uh, to rebound on uh, Francesco's point on uh, margin calls. Uh, indeed, we, we see this as a, as a real system. I mean, it's, potential, it's a potential systemic threat to the market to have these big margin calls. It's okay for strong players like us, but it can destabilize weaker players. And, and certainly it's not the best use of cash right now. Yeah, thanks a lot, Claire. I mean, it's fascinating times in which energy companies are calling for caps on, uh, on prices. Um, that is... Um... And, and it came from my traders. Yes. <laughs> Um, now, uh, maybe just one comment on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the gas demand. So Bruegel is also going to set up a, a gas demand tracker for different member states. So we hope to be able to, to show that to you in a, in a few weeks with, uh, where you can essentially see monthly gas demand development uh, in different sectors in European countries. Um, but uh, after this short commercial, um, let me give the, the floor to... Um, uh, to Joanna Pandera. Uh, Joanna is uh, currently the president of Forum Energie, uh, one of probably the most uh, important energy transition think tank in, um, in Poland. And uh, Joanna has a history in Polish government, uh, both with a focus on environment and a focus on Europe. So it's very well placed to uh, also kind of try to see what from, from your perspective are the things uh, that need to be urgently done to, to get us over the winter. Thank you very much, thank, uh, Georg, and thank you for the invitation. Indeed, a lot uh, has been said already because, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, we have to differentiate between long-term measures and short-term measures. Uh, what, uh, Long-term measures were discussed yesterday. Now we are discussing short-term measures. Among the short-term measures, I think that the mm, let's say, choice of what we can do is quite limited. Maybe one thing that we should differentiate between short-term measures we, which can really help us to overcome this winter and short-term measures like decisions which are needed uh, to be taken quickly, which will help, help us with the next winters. Uh, so this is something what I, I, I see a, a little chaos uh, at, among the decision makers in my country of, of what is needed. Uh, and uh, where are the priorities and uh, and certainly this is the biggest crisis ever we experience in energy sector so uh, we need to learn uh, probably after a few months or years we will be wiser uh, in delivering solution on how to tackle it but now uh, it's just big lesson for us and some decision makers including uh, my decision makers in my country they pretend they do everything in order to to show that there is no problem, don't look up, uh, we will uh, survive, all will be good uh, and uh, this is the major threat which I see now. So um, when, like, like really not taking the actions which are needed, not to be honest with voters also, uh, like uh, about, about how serious the situation is and uh, we mainly focus now on subsidizing consumers, uh, starting with households, where we know that um, in my view this is uh, not 100% uh, wrong because we need to help poorer people. Uh, some of the consumers will really struggle. In Poland we have huge uh, problem with heating, much larger than electricity. So actually uh, people who are burning coal in their households uh, will really uh, struggle with lack of fuel. It was Russian fuel. Poland decided to cut off the fuel in, already in April. So we now have the situation. We have no fuel. Uh, if we have it's 400% more expensive compared to the last year. So, so indeed, some help for poorer people is, is needed. But what I'm 
missing in this discussion is is the income criterion because now of course we are unprepared we have been talking for years that we need to solve energy poverty but in fact there is no data no clear uh, measures on what is energy poverty and how to tackle it and now exactly with this urgency, we only can spread the money from helicopter, uh, which will, in my view, only increase the problem, will um, will increase inflation, which in many countries is very high, uh, in my country 16% and growing. Uh, so th this is what I see. So. Uh, help only for selected consumers and uh, households are maybe key uh, on in the social terms but what i'm missing is to involve industry because uh, industry in my view is now just uh, left without any concept and the demand reduction in the industry can be really higher than uh, in households so of course we can call uh, we can uh, also uh, encourage decision makers to make a big campaign and to communicate with people uh, how serious the situation is and uh, but but still i think that the larger demand this, uh, destruction or reduction m m can be done in industry and uh, what we could see now already last week the biggest polish gas consumer azote they just stopped the produ production of fertilizer it's one of the largest fertilizer producers uh, in europe by the way uh, because they said uh, gas is just too expensive and uh, i think that we need really auctions uh, on demand reduction in the industry paid auctions uh, so uh, industry uh, now which is of course we, we, economy is heated so all is going still well uh, so we have high demand from uh, for, for all let's say the, the all the um, industrial production, but it may really be uh, at crisis at some point of time in winter with, uh, where many companies will say, no, I, I won't sell my products um, if the gas is so expensive, el electricity is so expensive. So I see it as a neck, uh, so households only limited income uh, criterion, industry uh, as a priority. Um, and. Uh, I think that uh, what is also very, very relevant uh, is exactly sending the signal what we will do uh, uh, next winter, because now we are uh, really spending uh, budgets uh, which are higher than the health uh, expenditures, uh, at least uh, also in my country. But what will happen next year? Uh, I mean, uh, what people should do in order to uh, to the, a lot of investments must can be done by people, by industry, and it's very important so that we will say invest in energy efficiency, build uh, renewables, we should overcome uh, grid congestions, which is now the major challenge. So we may speak about ambitious uh, renewables target, but once we want to overcome the mental but also technical barriers uh, in the uh, in integration of renewables. Uh, we want uh, really deliver the solution. Uh, so, so this is uh, and this is maybe also short term, but not necessarily bringing results uh, in the next winter. Uh, and this is what I uh, what I see as a major priorities. What I'm worried about is that we really now do everything in order to. Uh, uh, to uh, moderate the price signal and still the price signal. I, I think that all countries are doing it in a different way. Uh, and um, this uh, this is, by the way, also very important that we will coordinate it on the, on the European Commission level. I also think that the power system will be at trouble because we will now certainly uh, very fast uh, electrify our heating. This is something what is happening now in Poland. We we are, I think we are the largest heat pump market at the moment in Europe, or one of the largest. And we will face a tremendous, once our power system is not in trouble now, it will have a problem in the next uh, two winters. So exactly shifting the demand and flexibility of the power system, uh, tariff design uh, is, uh, is the next topic which 
which is short term, but will uh, bring uh, relief uh, in the years to come. And apart from this, I uh, just concluding last sentence because I, I see also the trend that we tend to see it and tend to say that now we are coming back to coal because coal has saved us. Uh, it's uh, I don't see really how we can increase production in coal. So those investments take years and uh, in many countries we just don't have coal and really uh, shifting imports uh, from Russia to other countries is also not the solution which we need because we see that for years we underestimate what actually energy uh, security means uh, and we made a lot of mistakes uh, and now in my view only energy efficiency demand reduction renewables development and flexibility of the power system and and uh, sector coupling also which will speed up is the solution thank you thanks <coughs> thanks a lot Diana. i uh, very much appreciate also the, uh, your point on uh, um, kind of targeted support to consumers and kind of this issue of vulnerable consumers which will probably be one of the most politically um, yeah, difficult points in the uh, in the coming winter for all european governments now what i find fascinating in the in the four presentations so far has been that um the, the kind of it's relatively consistent reduce demand reduce prices and reduce risk in the uh, in the in the energy trading now if you put it in that line it fits but if you turn it the other way around i have a bit of a struggle to see of whether how reduce prices and uh, and uh, as a as a result reduce demand is going to work so i think um, my take would be we, we should make sure that we have put the, the horse in front of the cart um but I would like to, to give the floor back to uh, um, uh, Dieter. With a, um, kind of we, we heard um, a lot in terms of market interventions, and uh, we know that on, on Friday there will be discussions. Uh, we understand that you're not going to, uh, to tell us uh, uh, the, the details of things, but it would be quite interesting to hear a bit your reaction on the, on the proposals that you have heard, including the, um, uh, the volatility cap that I found very interesting. Thank you very much. And indeed, really very, very good points have been made. And I think, as you've said, we have a fairly consistent assessment analysis of the challenges and also of the basic principles that will have to drive the interventions we will have to make, because we are in a, in a unique uh, crisis, the biggest energy crisis we have seen. Uh, it has macro impacts, as others have said. So we do need to act and we do need to intervene in ways that we had said a few years ago that that, that, that was uh, not the, the best way uh, to go. Um, and I think the points are very, very, uh, are very valid in, in that context. So if I can respond to a few of them. First of all, the concern about uh, collateral being required on companies, the very, very high levels, the impact it has on investments, on liquidity. This is obviously something that needs to be addressed and we are, we are looking at that. Um, we are if you look at the European angle to it, um, it is to make sure that the necessary state guarantees are possible, that we facilitate that so that that can take place in the smoothest possible way. But of course, also, as Mrs. Saracha has said, looking at the collateral requirements, looking at what can be done there from a financial market perspective. And here I'm way outside of energy. We're really looking into the broader, um, the, the broader markets uh, that, that are uh, relevant here um, as well. So that is part of uh, the, the discussion that is, uh, that is ongoing. Um, then Mr. Saracha also pointed to the need for further reform of the electricity market design and uh, I'm sure you will have seen that President von der Leyen has indeed announced that. So what we do now is what is the necessary emergency intervention immediate term? What is it we need to do right now? And that you could see as an early deliverable, as a front load in, in uh, the, the further work ongoing on electricity market design. I think, I hope we can all agree that a, a review, a revision of electricity market design is a complex exercise that one should not overtake overnight. And so there we are launching an, an inception impact assessment, a full impact assessment, public consultations, so as to make sure that we look at the relevant options in the context of a review and a revision of the electricity market design. And our aim is to come forward with a proposal next year. I think a number of the points made here have been uh, are part of, of what will be uh, considered, including the longer 
uh, term um, electricity market and how to link into some of the existing mechanisms, PPAs, which are an important part of the market and really critical to give some of that predictability and stability and incentivize investments into, uh, into renewable uh, energy. So, so very important uh, points. The points have also been made, um, Joanna, thank you for the need to bear in mind vulnerable households. How do we make sure that we address energy poverty? And how do we make sure that the interventions we have in mind, our emergency tools, that they help those, those groups? Um, and as you said, there are data challenges, uh, also because one vulnerable household in, in one member state is not necessarily a vulnerable household in another. So on the one hand, I think you have a very strong need for member state lead in deciding what, how is it done at national level, not what is done, but how is it done to adapt to national circumstances. But then at the same time, it has to be clear that there are certain certain minimum of uh, of terawatt hours that every household would need and so to look at how do we how do we balance that and as you have said Georg, how do we balance that with maintaining the necessary price signals to reduce demand because if we take away the price signal demand is not going to respond to the very high prices and to what is essentially a a, a shortage in our markets and so maintain a price signal, but making sure that we protect the vulnerable households, but also that we look, make sure that our industry remains uh, competitive and adapts to what is a new reality in, uh, in global and in European uh, uh, energy markets. Thank you. Thanks. Can I um, ask you, Claire, to, uh, to uh, come back to the question of market design so what would be your take i mean there is a is a timing issue i mean we, we need to do things in the, in the very short term uh, but as Dita said i mean uh, uh, we have now an electricity market design that has been developed over 20 30 years and has um, with the network code some thousand pages uh, so uh, going, going kind of putting hands on that will be will be quite complex um, do you see the the interventions that you're proposing as temporary measures or as things that are going already to be a structural um, uh, changes? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, um, indeed, I mean, uh, uh, for, first point, I very much concur with what uh, Dito was saying on the fact that uh, touching at market design it, I mean, it's something you, you, you should only do with a trembling hand, uh, meaning we, we have a market that has worked in normal times, and now it doesn't work, but we are in crazy times. Uh, so we need to make sure, uh, and I think that's very much uh, what uh, the European Commission has in mind, but this undertaking is done, I would say, in a very rational way with consultations to make sure that uh, we will have tomorrow a framework that enables the investments to be made, and at the same time that uh, may be improving some some. Uh, some features that we, we see as not, work, not working so well in, in the current uh, system. And frankly, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if Dito has the answers. Uh, I think it's a, well, it, it's, a, it's a whole work stream, uh, and uh, we will all need to put a lot of uh, intelligence into, into this. So the mechanisms I was thinking about are, uh, are indeed more short-term, and I don't know if they need to stay, but the idea that when markets are totally dysfunctional, uh, it, it can be a good idea to prevent the prices from uh, going to, to the roof. It's certainly something that uh, has been discovered by others. I'm thinking about Texas huh? in the energy crisis. Uh, we are in Europe in a market where on electricity prices, we almost have the opposite. I mean, each time a, a, a crazy level is reached, then the current mechanisms allows for a jump in the price of a thousand euro per megawatt hours automatically in the next few weeks. So we, we have, uh, in French, we would say échelle de perroquet. Huh? We have a kind of mechanism with automatic increases whenever uh, a, a crazy price is, uh, is uh, reached. We are currently at 4,000 uh, euros per megawatt hours as, a, 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 as, as a, a limit for now, but the, the limit uh, could, be, could be breached uh, with this mechanism and uh, automatically adjusted. Uh, just for reference, the average price one year ago, before the crisis, was 50-60, okay? So just to, to put things in perspective of how, how, di how uh, dysfunctional the, the market has gone. So yes, we do need to, uh, and for gas, I mean, the prices used to be around 20. Uh, we've seen more than 200, 300. So we are clearly 
I mean, multiplication of 10 or 15 times the, the normal prices is a dysfunctional market and we should have short-term measures to address them. And maybe, maybe they can stay in the long run. I mean, maybe, maybe we will be happy to have protections for future crises, which we hope we will avoid, but uh, limiting crazy prices. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Francesco, uh, can I ask you to maybe say uh, two more words on the um, kind of on the on the uh, volatility cap for the uh, for the TTF, and maybe indicate a bit kind of yeah how uh, how you think that could was it that kind of whether that will really no. address the, uh, the the issue substantially, or whether that will be more a temporary uh, measure that uh, that you uh, uh, that we need in the in the current situation. Let's all remember when did we start to use such a such an index. You know, we started to use this index about twelve years ago, ten years ago, and it was a very clever idea to to have such an index because it enhanced liquidity in the gas markets in Europe, which were not liquid. It gave uh, traders uh, common language with which molecules of gas could be valued around uh, the eurozone. So it, it served its purpose beautifully. And, and all of a sudden now we are demonizing the index. It's nothing wrong with the index itself. It's the way in which the fragility of the gas markets have shown uh, the index is simply a tool that explains us the, the situation, and, and this is a war, and in a war situation, typically, some free market economics need to be a little bit redesigned. I mean, uh, it's normal. But what I think we have to understand is that this mechanism is perverse. And, and I, I, I will just give you a small example so that we all understand what we're talking about here. Let's assume that states, member states of the union, give companies additional credit lines in order for them to uh, withstand the pressure of uh, the margin calls that uh, their contracts have. The net result of this will be for the price of gas to go higher. There will be no end to this, to this spiral. I mean, traders will push it to limits that today are even unthinkable because they will know that governments will fund this going forward without any limit. So, so this is the this is what we have in front of us. It's a tool that is completely out of hand, and it's not working for what it was designed to do. It's working without any control. So when this happens, you know, it, 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 there are many examples that similar things have happened in the past in different trades and in different trading platforms. But when this happens, it's normal to to just say, look. It's time to kind of put it back to rest. What we are saying is that we should just cap it to a level high enough to ensure that without any doubts, gas coming from outside of the Eurozone will find an attractive price in Europe. So you can say anything, uh, anything below 80 or anything above 80, but not certainly 300. So once you put this cap, you don't need to change contracts that are indexed to the TTF. You don't need to change anything. TTF will continue to work. But as Claire has said, you know, you've seen that there are European markets platform that cap European prices at 3,000 euros, 4,000 euros. Now, we would do the same on the TTF for a period of, say, six to eight months, just enough to go through the winter and the springtime of 2023. And then you can reassess this uh, it's not such a big traumatic change it's just a, a small um, intervention of the amsterdam exchange that would put this cap and once you've done that you give governments of europe and companies the time to do the proper thing which is what uh, the director general just said reflect on with the right timing on such an important thing as market design, which cannot be done overnight. It's, it's a very important issue. But you cannot this, do this with lucidity while you have such a big problem as this crazy mechanism killing your economy and, and preventing your uh, regulators and, and, and governments to really put time in the, the most important things. So I think it's something that would not take that much. Uh, and it, by the way, it will not prevent gas to be sold in Europe. 
on top of which I, I should add that would there be one cargo, two, three, four of LNG that would require higher prices? You can always say for that cargo, there is a CFD uh, mechanism and we will fund the, the additional money out of, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about really transparency in, in saying, you know, who is it that is selling us gas at 100 euros? Let's see who's this guy and, and, and why is this such an important cargo? But once that is clear, let's do that. So it's not such a, a very, such a big trauma. Now we can do it because can we, uh, after we finish the, the supply of, and then the storage of, uh, of gas. Okay, I think that's a, that's a topic that would merit uh, probably uh, an, an hour of discussion. Um, as, um, I mean, probably you're going to have these discussions quite quite often. As, uh, as Ditte <laughs> is uh, going to have to leave at, uh, uh, at half past sharp, I would like to allow the floor uh, um, one or two questions. I think there was one question from, uh, from Nicolas Veron uh, over there. Yes, thank you, uh, Nicolas Veron at Bruegel. Um, as you just said, Georg, it would require much more time, but I just would like to understand uh, the policy intent of this proposal on uh, margin requirements, because I know nothing about um, energy markets and the TTF, but uh, uh, I remember vividly moments in the Eurozone crisis where very similar claims were made about margin requirements on uh, markets that were related to sovereign debt, including a country Mr. Starche knows well, uh, and, uh, and, and we had that debate at Bruegel on several occasions, the clearinghouse at that time, of course, was uh, mainly uh, LCH, uh, and there is a fundamental challenge in asking a clearinghouse to basically break its risk management, its most important risk management mechanism in the middle of a crisis. So when you say it's a small thing to do, well, it's a small thing, but it's a big thing. And we know that uh, clearinghouses are very systemic. If they have bad risk management, uh, the bill will fall on the taxpayer. Uh, and uh, if we break their risk management uh, in the middle of a crisis, uh, probably bad things will happen. So. My question is whether you, question, you actually question the fundamental mechanism of having these uh, contracts cleared on a central clearinghouse or whether uh, your um, uh, call for intervention uh, is, uh, is, uh, is more modest. But in that case, I don't understand it. Thank you. Maybe I can explain that. No, I, 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 I think the, the margin uh, requirements need to be staying. And I think it's uh, fundamentally that, you know, this is a risk tool that no one can, uh, I mean, I think no one wishes to change. But the fact is that you have a margin call that moves up and down without any relation to the underlying commodity, because this is what TTF today is. There is no correlation between TTF prices and gas prices as they are imported into Europe. And the proof is that, you know, it, it's enough that, you know, Mr. Putin says something or, or Mrs. Uh, von der Leyen says something else that this index goes up and down 100 euros. And as a function of that, margin costs go up and down 100 euros for a billions and billions of euros. That has nothing to do with risk, with risk management. It's actually a worsening of the risk for everybody. That's what I'm saying is that the concept should stay. But the, the underlying uh, commodity and the index are completely disconnected as, as we are talking, and that's risky. Okay. Um, are there questions for Ms. Uh, Jorgensen? I see one there in the back. Yes. Uh, a question for the Director General. Uh, I'm Jan Lichens from the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs, and I was uh, I have a question on the intervention, a possible intervention in the electricity market, and I was wondering if you would introduce a price limit on inframarginal energy production, uh, non-gas energy production. Uh, how do you prevent uh, the market exchange drying up and shifting to over-the-counter trade? 
Thank you. So um, we are uh, designing the measure as we speak, discussing, uh, discussing internally. We have a, a technical seminar with all member states today on various aspects of both gas and electricity prices, and I'm going to Coripea after this. And so I think I will uh, uh, need to uh, respect those inter-institutional working, working uh, methods. We are obviously looking uh, carefully at what is the best form of intervention, once again, I set out the guiding principles, our red line, so to say, in the beginning in terms of internal market functioning, ensuring that, there, that we are aligned with the Green Deal, so that that requires us to uh, maintain the necessary investment incentives for renewables, uh, among, among other things. Um, and in, in terms of the, the markets working together, um, OTC and others, I think it's important to bear in mind that um, that there is a link here with the longer term electricity market that Staracha, that Mr. Staracha has, has pointed to, the PPAs that you have pointed to, that there are different ways of organizing uh, that market and that is not a bad thing in and of itself. So to the extent you get investor certainty, uh, stability, predictability in these markets, well, then I think we are aligning with what is one of the guiding principles we've set ourselves. And that is somewhat veiled terms to try to, uh, to explain the direction we are taking while respecting the, the inter-institutional process and most importantly, respecting the fact that energy ministers are meeting on, on Monday to, uh, to discuss that and hopefully give some guidance in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, next steps. The other point I wanted to make, and here I'm coming in on some of the points that Mr. Saracha and, and others have been making, is uh, right here and now the focus is on electricity Electricity prices, electricity markets, but I think as others have also pointed out, we of course need to look at the at the TTF, look at the benchmarks. We have what is the best way to do that. We need to look at the financial market aspects. We need to look at the consumer aspects, and so I think we can say that we've got we've got our work carved out for us for uh, the coming months. But as you have also said, Joanna, not just for this winter, but we also need to look at the winter ahead and how do we make sure that storage fills in the next uh, storage filling season uh, so this crisis is not uh, is not over with one proposal next week there's going to be a lot more uh, happening need for more analysis and i think one of the uh, encouraging aspects of that is that we have seen from across uh, european member states really interesting uh, analysis ideas uh, we have been inspired by by some of that you've seen some interesting greek ideas on uh, on, uh, on on the revenue model and electricity for example and that's just one example of the many useful ideas that have been circulating uh, and so in that sense i think we're 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 working in a um, in a very European way, uh, seeking European solutions where that is needed, but obviously reflecting specific national circumstances uh, where that is needed. Thank you. So, then, yeah, there's one question there. Um, Thank you, Can Erjan, Energy Councillor from Turkish Permanent Delegation to the EU. Uh, yesterday and today, the headlines were on Russian and Chinese agreement on all terms for additional supply of Russian gas to China via Mongolia. And my takeaway from yesterday's and today's, this morning's excellent sessions in Bruegel's annual meeting is that we are heading towards a more polarized world. As recently seen in Black Sea Grain Deal, Turkey is an indispensable game changer in times of crisis. Also, Turkey is also European member country, a candidate member country, who can potentially uh, can lower, lower gas and electricity prices of European consumers. So, uh, but in EU uh, repower strategy, we don't see any well-balanced uh, approach towards Turkey. Uh, because Turkey is not a solely gas transit country, but with a huge potential to produce uh, renewable energy. It's currently 55%. So how do you evaluate uh, untapped and undiscussed role of Turkey to lower gas and electricity prices in Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe? Thank you very much. 
Thank you. I can uh, say a few words about that before I, I go to uh, Coripea, uh, where, where, where colleagues are um, awaiting. So uh, our repower strategy that we've set out earlier this year is for Europe and for countries uh, in our neighbourhood, and so very much uh, working with uh, with uh, with Turkey also in, uh, in in that context. Turkey is part of our electricity grid. We already have a very close close integration in terms of energy markets, uh, and we see scope for closer cooperation also as regards to gas transit, as you have mentioned, but really closer cooperation in terms of making best use of the LNG infrastructure and in, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, supply. So that's very much an integrated part of, of the work we're doing. I haven't talked a lot about uh, supply today and gas supplies, but you know a lot of work ongoing under the EU energy platform, significant diversification since the beginning of the year with very impressive amounts uh, in, in the sense that uh, additional LNG coming in has more than replaced the reduction we have seen in, from uh, from Russian supplies. And again, uh, close cooperation, close partnership with Turkey, both in terms of electricity and gas, within that uh, overarching framework, and very much with the overall uh, with the overall neighbourhood, uh, the Western Balkans, Ukraine, and Moldova are very close partners in this context as well. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dieter. And um, then. Um... <laughs> Don't want to, get, to keep you from um, the Corepa. And uh, but it, I think it's very helpful that we kind of uh, have at the end also a switch from uh, demand to supply side and and also short term supply side options. My feeling, and we we published a paper on uh, on kind of a European grand energy bargain yesterday, where we are also arguing that there's not only demand side options untapped in Europe left, but there are still also short term supply side options that uh, that can be uh, drawn into. And uh, I think, Joanna. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to comment yeah. because indeed there is a new topic which emerged uh, after uh, war uh, in Ukraine escalated, is the topic of interconnection uh, with Ukraine, uh, electricity grids with Ukraine. So it's actually very uh, fast changing topic. I don't know to which extent you see that, but we see it uh, as uh, Ukraine at the moment has a huge oversupply and there are some grids in example with Poland, but not only with Poland, with other countries as well. And now we are discussing, so, so first some decisions were taken in order to um, extend the grid until end of, of this year. So it's speed investment, but still is the question mark to which extent we want to integrate Ukraine market, what does it mean in terms of ETS uh, and CO2, uh, and, and for it seems that also for Ukraine is a very important topic. I've heard President Zelensky saying we cannot uh, sell wheat, so we will sell electricity, and, and now uh, indeed uh, it is also very important on which role uh, this electricity from Ukraine could play in Europe in terms of uh, uh, of, um, let's say, shortage of, of energy. And one comment on market design very quickly, because I think that you're right, Claire, that uh, the market design was right, but it was done actually 10, 15 years ago, uh, the principle for it, and uh, the market has changed. So we have different uh, energy sources with different generation, completely different. And in my view, it was okay, but now it is not okay anymore. And uh, this discussion was just too slow on how to change the market design. We were not forced to do this. Now we are forced to do it. And in my view, it is not only short term, uh, it will be for longer. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, the thinking now in this uh, market uh, design reform, rather, uh, you know, that it will stay with us. I don't, I cannot imagine that, uh, that we will come back with having, you know, such a larger share of renewables that we will come back to the old principles uh, where we cannot actually see the benefits of uh, increasing share of renewables with uh, zero marginal costs. So this this is one comment from my side. I see uh, two more questions. Uh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Sammy Haraz from the SRB. Maybe following on from the question that Nicola had earlier, and particularly to Francesco and Claire, given the absence of a cap at the moment, how are you managing right now your risk? Because that, that's kind of what's puzzling me a bit about this debate, right? You've got the slightly dysfunctional derivatives markets, um, and just managing on the spot, I'm sure your risk managers would have a heart attack. So how are you, how are you doing it right now? 
Clint? Uh, uh, Frances Francesco? Maybe Claire should start. Okay. Yes, you just. Yeah, no, well, uh, we have looked carefully at uh, our management of risk, of course, to uh, try to minimize the, the impact of this volatility and the, the associated margin calls. And we do face large margin calls. So uh, we, we are, but as a big company, I mean, we have secured all the liquidity we need. And so we are confident that we're able to face these, uh, these, these big margin calls. They, they can, I mean, they are really very sizable. Uh, but the, the, the concern we have as a market player is really uh, about uh, smaller actors, weaker actors, and something that's, that may not be obvious for all of you, although I'm sure there are many energy specialists in the room, is that energy markets, energy players are by nature hedging themselves. I mean, we are, we are on a market where, where there are all kinds of uh, uh, hedging. Whenever we take a consumer on, for instance, we're hedging uh, for, for its future consumption. No? That's, that's the way the market operates. So that's very intrinsic to the market to have these kinds of, of, of positions, uh, which means that large players, I mean, and it's true for large players and smaller players, large players know how to, to, how to, to manage their risk, basically to ensure that they have ample liquidity, uh, I mean, both inside and with short credit declines if needed. Uh, smaller players, it might be more tricky. So uh, to, to get back to Francesco's point uh, earlier, the idea is not to, uh, uh, to suppress uh, all mechanisms uh, that uh, indeed uh, protect, um, protect actors such as LCH, but really to find ways to make sure that we are not going to end up in a systemic crisis where a, a small actor will be unable to face its margin calls and, uh, and, and may be triggered into uh, fire cells hence destabilizing even more the market. Let me add to, to what Claire said, because what she said is exactly the way we work. But typically, we have been doing this for many, many years. So when this crisis, for example, started about September, October last year, you remember prices were sur surprisingly high already on the gas market in, uh, and, and the TTF was going to 80, 90 euros, which was first time ever. Um, at that time, we had already sold energy through 2021 and 2022, and partly 2023. And, and that we always do. So when we buy uh, gas from Algeria, from the US, this gas is sold forward on the market. And as a function of that, prices are set for customers. So you can say that our hedge is the hedge of our customers. Our customers, the ones that we have sold energy at fixed prices to, uh, did not experience any price increase through 21 and 22. So that hedge goes to customers eventually. But again, like Claire said, this is because we are a large company and we have a policy that started a long time ago. So this is something that we carry on all the time. What we are concerned about are two things that number one, the hedge, I mean, the, the, the margin calls are freezing inordinate amount of money, like 10 times what they used to freeze uh, two years ago. And that is a damage to us and, and the, rest, the rest of the system. This money cannot work. This money cannot be used for investment. It's just set aside. It's our money, it's not that. It's, we have the cash, but we cannot use it. So this is a damage on the longer term, 23, 24, if this doesn't change, there will be less money to, to invest. And number two, it's true that minor players have had problems, not even minor players. If you talk about Uniper, it's not a small player, it's a large player, and it had to be helped by the KFW in, in Germany because of this problem. So if small or medium-sized players default, the net result is that they will have to unwind their position on the, on, the, on the exchange. The net result will be an increase of the TTF index, which result in higher margin calls for everybody. So it's a domino effect. We think we should have to cut before it triggers some systemic damage. That is why I think the index needs to be stopped for a while. Thanks a lot, Francesco. Let me give 
the last word to uh, Joanna. I think we are uh, at the at the end of um, the uh, the time for today. Um, I think um, we all understand that this topic is. is extremely dynamic and is moving and i mean at the beginning of this year we had problems with thinking about how we can come physically over the next winter that seems to be getting more well we are get, seem to, seem to be getting more relaxed because demand destruction as, as claire said has been has been dramatic and we also managed to to get additional supplies so on that front it's more calm than currently the issue of high prices and then in the in the longer term uh, or in the upcoming term now the question also about the the interaction of energy companies in the market so i think it will not uh, become boring in the next months and uh, i hope <laughs> you uh, um you you stay also with uh, with us in uh, in uh, in our analysis and help us uh, uh, also to to guide uh, our analysis and um i would yeah like to, to give the last word uh, to, uh, to Johanna and thanks for so, much. Sorry, I know that once you finish the debate, everybody is just wait to, to walk out. But uh, I, I want to uh, put one uh, thing, uh, let's say, at the very end. It's, it's a pity that Dita left because what I think is really that the European Commission should take the initiative on vulnerable households because uh, it's now the topic which is entirely uh, left to the member state level and in my view many countries do not have such policies and we took as as country as EU the decision that we will face uh, out Russian fossil fuels which I think is 100% right but now what we can see it, it was political decision and actually the cost of it will be paid by society and among others the poorer ones uh, so uh, what I think is, is really now very important to, to push countries to prepare for this I, I, I'm not worried about market design because I think that utilities will always do everything in order to protect their businesses. But what we may really lose in the next months or years to come is this uh, unity within the EU that, uh, that the project will really not forget about people uh, who are at the end of the entire ecosystem uh, and uh, be because they will pay, uh, the, the cost for them uh, will be really high. And this is something what I think initiative of the European Commission is needed, uh, calling mem push, uh, force member states, not only uh, reduce demand, but also uh, prepare really good programs for, uh, for uh, people who are a little poorer, a little more uh, vulnerable than others. Uh, so this is from my side. Thank you. I couldn't add anything. I mean, it's a, it's, I think it's a, a crucial point, not only for uh, for social purposes, but also for uh, for political um, uh, yeah, for political unity and uh, and eventually the support of uh, of Ukraine in this war. Because if um, if we don't manage to protect uh, consumers, we have seen the demonstrations in Prague, and uh, I think the um, this unsettling development is uh, is risking to uh, to propagate throughout the winter so thank you very much for uh, for joining us and uh, and uh, sorry for not having been able to take all the questions um, um, thanks <laughs>